Uh, welcome to my talk on uh, Riemann polya and uh, two other concepts, Van Danzig pairs, walled couples, and then uh, Leonard Bonderson and Olaf Thorin uh, for something called generalized gamma convolutions, GGCs. And the goal here is to give some background on a set of tools and techniques for solving the Riemann hypothesis and essentially finding zeros of uh, entire functions. Okay, so let me, uh, let me start. So here's the motivation. Uh, so 1859, a very famous problem, the Riemann hypothesis, uh, looking at the Raymond zeta function and Raymond xi function. Uh, and how do you find the zeros uh, of that function? Do all the zeros uh, lie on the critical line, uh, half plus or minus is? And Riemann and then Pollier in the 1920s uh, followed up and tried to study the general problem of finding zeros of entire functions. Uh, what's the goal here? The goal here is uh, to give background to another YouTube video that uh, I've put up uh, on Hilbert's eighth problem uh, called Riemann Hypothesis of Short Proof, which you can Google and find. And the goal here is just to, to provide background material and essentially to develop a duality between Hadamard factorization or hadamard westrass factorization of entire functions uh, and something called Van Danzig pairs and walled couples. Uh, and again, that will also be related to uh, Leonard Bonderson and Olaf Thorin's framework uh, on something called generalized gamma convolutions to characterize the real zeros. And you'll see in the slides today, uh, many applications. There's the classic riemann zeta function uh, and then questions about what's known as generalized Riemann hypotheses or L functions, and then just some more standard functions, trigonometric, hyperbolic, reciprocal gamma functions, just to give you some examples and applications of the theory. And I'll do my best to construct wherever possible uh, the Van Danzig pairs and wall couples directly. So the Riemann hypothesis problem uh, to characterize the zeros of the, of the psi function or zeta function. Uh, both him and Polya, uh, more specifically Polya, tried to tackle the problem by looking at properties of kernels phi of t that are sufficient to secure that the Fourier transform uh, only has real zeros. So this was a, a research paradigm that uh, Polya uh, undertook uh, and tried to use it to prove the Riemann hypothesis. And the whole point of, uh, of today's talk is that rather than looking at properties of the probability density or directly of the Fourier transform, uh, you can actually look at the reciprocal xi function and calculate something called a Thorin measure. So that's, that's coming up and that's the, that's the insight that we're providing here. Okay, so very quickly, uh, as I said, I have another video up online uh, talking about this problem. There's a definition of the zeta function, the xi function, uh, the Riemann hypo hypothesis, uh, do all the non-trivial zeros of the zeta function land the critical line, real s equals a half, or equivalently, if we look at the uh, regularized version of the zeta function, the xi function, uh, are those lie on the real axis. And as I said, there are two approaches to try and tackle that. One is directly to look at the density the riemann polyer approach, or alternatively, to look at this reciprocal of that function and to look at something called Thorin's condition. And so really the key, the key insight uh, is that rather than, than the, than the riemann polyer framework, it's much better to understand what's known as generalized gamma convolutions. Uh, Lendert Bonderson has the classic book on that, uh, and to look at the reciprocal xi function instead of the xi function itself. Okay, so one slide uh, summary of, of the Riemann poly density. Uh, so Riemann back in 1859 uh, showed that, uh, that the Xi function was a, was a uh, Mellin transform or if I transform a Laplace transform. Uh, and he explicitly found the density uh, and the density is, is symmetric uh, and it has uh, a rather interesting looking form as an infinite sum uh, of a weighted set of essentially what look like extreme value distributions. And again, that's calculated from the Jacobi function. Now, how would you, how would you try and prove directly an in density space uh, 
uh, of whether a function uh, has zeros or not. Well, for sigma bigger than one, so we're not looking at the critical strip, uh, that was essentially proved by Kinchin in the 1930s, uh, and essentially showed that you can look at the Fourier transform and show that the random variable that is underlying that is something known as infinitely divisible. Uh, Dafinetti and Levy were the two people that uh, uh, looked at the concept of uh, infinite divisibility uh, in the 1920s. Uh, now, what's the issue with the Riemann hypothesis? Why, why, why does that Riemann poly density framework, why is it much harder to, to implement? Well, in the critical strip, or from a half to one, remember this function is also symmetric, uh, it's not infinitely divisible. Actually, in some sense, it's closely to infinitely divisible. Sometimes people call this pretend infinite divisibility. So this would be what's known as the, as the Levy measure up here. Uh, and because of the cosine, uh, the Levy measure is actually a signed Levy measure. So not infinitely divisible, but something called pretend uh, infinitely divisible. But of course, much harder to show, uh, to show whether these things uh, have zeros or not. Much easier in that top case. Uh, again, just one slide on, on Polyus theorem. Uh, it's an interesting idea of if I look directly at the Fourier transform, so let g of z be the, be the function I want to look at, be the entire function of order of order 0 or 1. Uh, and then, rather interestingly, if we look at combinations, so let's look at this new function here, uh, then this new function here, uh, also only has real zeros. And there's a very simple uh, proof, uh, taking a zero, uh, looking at a, at a bound, uh, and then very simple to see that that must be true. And one of the more interesting uh, discussions of this is I think in the 1920s, a discussion of Polya's original paper, Mark Kack has uh, has a similar proof of sort of Ising type uh, type spin models that that became in the 1950s more the more the Li Yang uh, uh, approach to these things. So Polya's theorem directly lets lets you look at Fourier transforms and directly tries to characterize real zeros of uh, of Fourier transforms. Okay, now let's let's move to the, to the to the alternative approach, uh, which is the approach that uh, we want to take here. So. And again, really maybe one of the key insights to take away is rather than looking in density space and rather than try to directly look at Fourier transforms, we're going to look at the reciprocal function. So remember, Riemann and Polya uh, are the two people uh, that looked in density space. I wanted to find something called a Van Danzig pair and a walled couple uh, for looking at the reciprocal function. And then I want to talk about what's known as generalized gamma convolutions and I want to talk about something called Thorin's condition for the Riemann hypothesis. So I think this, this motivates it quite nicely. Uh, essentially, Riemann and Polly are looking at directly at the, at the Xi function, and essentially Thorin's condition uh, is looking at the ratio. And in terms of random variables, uh, you can think of the first one uh, as a moment generating function, and you can think of the second one as a uh, Laplace transform. And this will be essentially uh, the identity that you get for Van Danzig walled uh, couples and pairs. As I said, Leonard Bonnison really has the classic text on that, so I recommend you taking a look at that. Uh, again, if you look at my other video, and I'll talk a little bit more here about it as well, what's Thorin's condition for the Riemann hypothesis? Uh, rather interestingly, uh, Thorin's condition you only have to show is true for s bigger than zero. Essentially, you're taking this, this ratio up here, replacing s by the square root of s, and you're essentially showing that the reciprocal uh, of the Xi function evaluated at root s, at root s is a Laplace transform uh, of something called a generalized gamma convolution. Uh, and the other very interesting insight of Thorin's condition, even though it's a simple condition, uh, you only have to check it for real s bigger than zero. So that's another interesting uh, property of Thorin's condition. Uh, Leonard Bonnison has a, has a concept of a function being hyperbolically completely monotone, and another way of saying Thorin's condition is that the left-hand side uh, 
functions are hyperbolically completely monotone function. Uh, now, why are generalized gamma convolutions important? Uh, well, it's because they're analytic on the cut plane, complex plane minus uh, minus infinity to zero. So we can we can deduce that the denominator that's sitting in there doesn't actually have any zeros, uh, which is which is going to prove the Riemann hypothesis for us. Okay, so there's the insight. Rather than looking on the left-hand side directly on the Fourier transform, we're going to look at the reciprocal function. Uh, and we're going to try and prove that the reciprocal function evaluated at root s is a Laplace transform of GGC. Uh, and as I said before, it won't just apply to the Riemann uh, Zeit function, it'll apply to L functions, so it'll, it'll do a number of generalized Riemann hypotheses for us. And I'll show you some examples of trigonometric and hyperbolic functions just to show you what, uh, uh, how the theory works. So uh, it's a nice theory for finding zeros of, of entire functions. Just a couple of quick definitions. Uh, a pair of analytical functions, f and g, are in the Van Danzig class if f of s and 1 over f evaluated at is uh, are both characteristic functions. Uh, and so you can see, similar to the last slide, I have a condition that looks, uh, that looks very similar. Uh, if I go one step further and define a walled couple, uh, and essentially the link between the two concepts is that when h hat is a, what's known as a scale mixture of normal distributions, uh, we then have the identity that the that the Fourier transform of h hat is equal to the Laplace transform evaluated at s squared, uh, and essentially you see that the two conditions are, the two conditions are very similar. And just to, just to remind you, uh, essentially. Thorin's condition is essentially similar to finding Van Danzig walled couples. Okay. Oh, and there's, there's a couple of interesting classes of, of random. Sometimes little f is equal to g, and so uh, you'll see some of these functions come up. Uh, actually, this should be normal, normal distribution. So, okay. So very quickly, another way of, of stating the Riemann hypothesis is Thorin's condition. If you look in Leonard Bonnison's book, page 124, uh, you're showing that the reciprocal psi function is essentially a Laplace transform of a GGC. Uh, or equivalently, uh, you can also show that uh, the reciprocal now evaluated at S, not root S, is a Fourier transform, uh, and essentially G hat will be what's known as an extended generalized gamma convolution. You know, essentially the scale mixture of normals uh, evaluated, uh, or where the mixing measure is H, the GGC. Uh, in terms of density space, quite often we won't talk in terms of densities, but in terms of densities, this is equivalent to uh, the reciprocal function being a Laplace transform of a density, where the density is known as something called a polyfrequency function. And there's a nice relationship between polyfrequency functions and something called uh, Laguerre poly uh, entire class of entire functions. And again, I keep on repeating that we won't really look much at densities. We'll, we'll find these things called Thorin measures. So here's just a couple of, of definitions. I've provided a link to, uh, to the archive paper. So uh, I, uh, I sort of recommend you go look there. Uh, the, the Laguerre poly class uh, essentially uh, class of entire functions that uh, you can factorize. Uh, essentially, we're keen to find the zeros, uh, rho sub n of this function. And again, with the Riemann Zeit function, we'll, we'll restrict ourselves to the case where you have an even function, and so that the, the exponential terms will disappear. Uh, the policy frequent, the, the, sorry, the poly of frequency function definition uh, is just a <coughs> measurable function that satisfies a bunch of, of of determinant conditions, and really the key result that relates Laplace transforms of poly frequency functions to reciprocals of, of Laguerre poly entire functions is a result due to, due, to, due, due to Schoenberg. And there's another nice paper, uh, Curry and Schoenberg, I think in the 1960s, 1966, that also provides a number of examples. Okay, so there's the Gare polyer class, and there's polyer frequency function. And again, just to remind ourselves, uh, 
to show the Riemann hypothesis, we're really looking at these two uh, at these two conditions here, and we'll focus just on the top one, and we'll find the Thorin measure, and we won't bother to deal with with the density space. Okay, a couple of other definitions. Uh, so, uh, Olaf Thorin and his student Leonard Bonnison uh, have worked on on distributions called generalized gamma convolutions, uh, and so. They're related to Levy densities, uh, and essentially the kernel looks like log of, of z over z plus s times what's known as the Thorin measure. So in all our examples, uh, we're keen to find our Thorin measure u. And how is it related to, to Levy measures? Uh, well, it's related to Levy measures where the Levy measure is essentially a completely monotone function. So essentially we can write to G of T as a mixture of exponentials. So there's GGC and there's Thorin measure. Uh, we won't talk much about it, but we could also uh, talk in terms of extended generalized gamma convolutions or symmetric EGGCs on the real line. So now you've moved to the real line from zero to infinity and essentially a similar looking, uh, similar looking formula. And again, our scale mixture of normals I uh, just checked that the Fourier transform of a scale mixture of normals can essentially be written as a Laplace transform now evaluated at S squared of the mixing measure H. So that's an extended GGC. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so now uh, how are we going to apply this? Uh, well, let's go back to our Laguerre Polya class. And in particular, let's just consider, consider entire functions of order one. And then in particular, again, we could, we'll, then, we'll then just assume that we have an even function. So our b sub f is equal to zero. If it's even, we'll have, row, we'll have zeros plus or minus rho. And again, if we look at our essentially hadamard weierstrass or Laguerre poly factorization, uh, put in the fact that uh, uh, you're considering an even function, you see a rather nice representation of the ratio function. So the ratio function is a product over the zeros of the function of rho squared over rho squared plus tau squared. <coughs> Excuse me. And again, you'll see that the rho squared are intimately related to the Thorin measure u uh, dz. And so this will lead us to a GGC representation. So if we actually want to characterize the zeros of entire functions, we can do it by essentially looking at the reciprocal function and then essentially characterizing its Thorin measure. Okay, so how does that work? Uh, well, essentially simple algebra with one of the one of the classic identities that gets used in GGCs, which is something called Frullinelli's identity. So if we take what we had on the on the last page, exponentiate it, write it as an integral with respect to a Thorin measure. Uh, we see essentially that we can write uh, an entire function as a uh, uh, as a Laplace transform of a, of, a, of a GGC. Excuse me. So that rather nice uh, duality between looking at entire functions that are even and writing them as Laplace transforms of uh, of GGCs and the underlying uh, GGC is essentially a convolution of exponentials. Okay. Uh, oh, and again, throughout, essentially, uh, using the theory of completely monotone or Bernstein functions. Okay, so how do we find the Hadamard product? Well, again, we, we want to relate it back to our Van Danzig pairs and wall couples. Uh, again, if you, if you go to the archive link, uh, you'll see a, a very simple little theorem that's quite nice. Uh, if I directly look at the function itself uh, and then try and find the, the walled couple that goes with it, looking at the ratio, uh, evaluating at square root of s, uh, essentially, if I can show that h is GGC, I know that the analytical continuation, uh, I know that the denominator in this thing here, because I know the, the right-hand side can't be infinite, I know I've got no zeros of... of uh, uh, of f evaluated at alpha plus root s. Uh, 
and we'll see how that's used in the Riemann hypothesis in a second. So essentially the link between uh, Van Danzig pairs and walled couples and zeros of, uh, of even entire functions is given by this little lemma here. Okay, now one other thing that we have to do, remember that we have to find the Thorin measure if we actually want to find the zeros row. So uh, we have to go from Levy measure to, to Thorin measure. So what do I mean by that? Well, if I look at this top identity, uh, mu would be the would be the Levy measure, and nu would be the the Thorin measure. So I need to be able to flip between the two. So uh, you'll see on the next page there's a there's a very clever little identity that lets you flip between the two. So if I look at the function itself, I've got the top representation. If I essentially take the reciprocal, I want to see how does mu transform to nu? So how do I go from my Levy measure mu to my Thorin measure nu? And there's a uh, explicit formula for the Thorin measure big U in terms of the Levy measure mu. So in order to justify that to you, uh, I need to show you how to get from uh, the top equation to the second equation. And that essentially comes from uh, two key GGC identities. So the first one really just comes from something called called Levy's formula. If I expand out and uh, properties of Bessel functions, I can explicitly calculate all those integrals. And the term that's in the, that's in the Levy measure uh, can be written as an integral. And then you see that I need to go a little bit further uh, and deal with this term here. And essentially what I need to show is I need to show that that term on the left-hand side is completely monotone. Uh, and again, the mixing measure that makes it completely monotone is, is given by that function there. And if I put those two together, if I integrate marginalize out over the Levy measure mu and do the same thing on the bottom, if I go back, I can see how uh, by replacing this top equation uh, with the identity, I get the second equation Mixing over mu, I get to see what my Thorin measure is. So there's again a very nice way of going from Levy measures to to Thorin measures, and again a couple of of well-known examples: gamma functions, the zeta function. Uh, you can explicitly work out the Levy measures, and then essentially you can you can use uh, that lemma to then work out what the uh, what the Thorin measures are. Uh, and again, just to just to you know, why are we doing this? Uh, it's essentially to show that if you can check Thorin, Thorin's condition, so rather than looking in density space, rather than directly looking at the Fourier transform representation of the of the psi function that Riemann and uh, and Polya spent uh, a lot of time on, instead look at the reciprocal function evaluated at root s uh, and prove Thorin's condition, find a GGC. Uh, and again, really the great trick is we talked about it a couple of slides ago. Uh, is that if that's true, the denominator can't have any zeros. Uh, and so, in, uh, therefore, and remember that we only have to check this for real s as well. And so that means that the, the, the psi function or psi of a half plus s has no zeros for real s bigger than zero. So that means that x psi of s on its own, if I take the half out, has no zeros for real s bigger than a half. And then by essentially the uh, Riemann symmetry condition, uh, it can't have any zeros for real s less than half either. So what does that mean? It means that if x i of s is equal to zero, that means that uh, the real part of s must be equal to half. And so that's essentially the, essentially the Riemann hypothesis. So this idea of, of looking at ratios of functions and checking Thorin's condition when finding zeros of entire functions are a very powerful tool, partly because of this analytic uh, continuation uh, of a G of the of the Laplace transform of a GGC, uh, so that's really really the meat of uh, of why it's so useful. Uh, just one other quick little aside: uh, there's another class of functions called mean zero uh, ferromag ferromagnetic functions, and again, uh, that was the you know Mark Kack or Mark Koch in the in his discussion of Polio's original paper. Uh, basically talks about uh, talks about that condition too, and that became sort of Li Yang theory. And uh, and Neumann also has a nice paper in the seventies talking about the Riemann hypothesis and such things.
So another related class of functions. Okay, so in, in uh, the time I have left, I just want to very quickly go over some examples. Again, if you, if you, if you look in the, in, in the comments, there's a link to the archive paper, so uh, you, can, you can find the details there, but it's interesting to see, see how does it work, right? So let me take a function like, like shine of uh, s over s and take its head of my product. Uh, then we can see that the GGC that's underlying that, uh, remember if I look at the zeros, remember that little identity that, that took an even function and wrote it with Frudinelli's formula uh, as a GGC. It's essentially a sum of exponentials over n squared. Uh, or again, if I wanted to look at it in terms of moment generating functions uh, of uh, EGGC, so the Laplace distribution. Uh, with density essentially e to the minus absolute value of x uh, is a scale mixture of normals where the mixing measures an exponential. So this would be the, the h in previous slides. Uh, essentially has Fourier transform 1 over uh, 1 plus s squared. So again, we can write uh, the reciprocal function. Remember, the key is to, to look at reciprocal functions. Uh, we can also write that as a Fourier transform. Oh, and again, a lot of people have looked at classes of functions very similar. A uh, famous paper by, by Ramanujan that, that studied the class of functions that looks very similar, whether, whether zeros are not n squared over pi squared, but whether zeros are alpha plus uh, n times beta. Okay, so there's uh, one example. Uh, the, the Riemann zeta function. Uh, again, if you look at my previous video, uh, you'll see me do the details of this. Uh, essentially, if alpha is bigger than zero, I can use the, the famous classic Euler product formula and essentially work out the Levy measure uh, in terms of primes. This, this can then be rewritten in terms of the von Mandelgott function. Uh, and so essentially, we can find the Levy representation for the zeta function. Uh, and then again, don't forget that you can then move from Levy measures to Thorin measures that's important because you need to prove that the distribution you're going to get is a GGC. Uh, again, the details for this are in uh, another video and a paper on the archive. Uh, how do you check Thorin's condition for uh, the Riemann psi function? Uh, and one other, one other little point uh, is that you can only use the Euler product formula for when alpha is bigger than 1. Uh, and you'd like to do the case when alpha is equal to a half. So you need some form of analytical continuation to be able to do this. Uh, and again, on the right-hand side, these coefficients will be calculated uh, from, from above and essentially be able to, to check Thorin's condition for where phi is equal to the reciprocal side function. So as I said, details are in a previous video on, on a paper in the archive. Okay, just a, just a few more examples just to show you how things work. Uh, if I looked at the gamma function, again, if I now look at the reciprocal gamma function, I want to show it's, if I evaluated at root s, uh, this uh, argument there would become s. I want to show it's a Laplace transform of a, of a GGC, which it is, uh, and essentially there's my, uh, there's my GGC random variable. And h sub 1k has got a reciprocal gamma uh, distribution. Okay, another family of distributions. If I look at uh, scaled by an exponential, uh, there's a famous result, Judah Hartman, uh, that says that uh, this exponentially tilted reciprocal gamma is also a scale mixture of normals. Uh, Thorin, him, Thorin himself did a bunch of examples, gamma 1 minus s and 1 over cos uh, of pi s and show they were MGFs of uh, extended uh, generalized gamma convolutions. Uh, the gumba's another interesting case. Uh, the gumba's essentially a log exponential. Uh, if you look at the densities uh, that are sitting there and you look at the Levy measure, uh, the Levy measure for a gamma looks like one over e to the t minus one. And again, if you go through the math, uh, you can see uh, you can see there's a Van Danzig class down here, and there's the there's the function one over cosh 
uh, that sits in the gamble. Another very interesting class of functions that Polya used, and Polya did his best to, to, to look at the density, and he came up with something called a falsified uh, Xi function where he essentially tried to approximate the density by, uh, in, in the Riemann hypothesis by a mixture of Bessel functions and then used his theorem that characterizes real zeros of sums of, uh, of functions. So another classic uh, set of, set of uh, functions of Bessel and McDonald functions. Uh, again, Mark Kack, I think, also worked on these problems. And again, you can identify the densities and you can identify the, the, the real zero properties as well. So another interesting class. Uh, hyperbolic functions. Uh, again, these are going to be sort of self-reciprocal functions that lie in the Van Danzig and, and Wall couples class. So a density that looks like uh, a beta distribution, but <coughs> a beta distribution on the range minus, minus one to one. Again, you can work out uh, essentially a walled couple. Uh, the Fourier transform, so the F function, uh, can be determined in terms of uh, special functions of the first kind, which then have a, a uh, hadamard weierstrass factorization. Uh, it turns out that if you look at the reciprocal function, that's also a Fourier transform. Uh, and again, very similar to the example we looked at before, uh, if I take a Laplace with density essentially uh, e to the minus a half absolute value of x, and I look at the Fourier transform of that, uh, I essentially get uh, I essentially get uh, a, uh, a walled couple. And those examples we looked at at the beginning, uh, special cases would be cosine 1 upon cosh, I remember that example we looked at sin s upon s, uh, which was also also zero mean ferromagnetic, and s over sin s. So hyperbolic functions are also are also interesting, and again the underlying GGC just to make the point, uh, or here the underlying EGGC, uh, because I'm looking at uh, the Laplace density, is a simple mixture of Laplace uh, scaled by the zeros. Remember the Laplace density is a square mixture of normals, uh, so I can write it as, as a square root of 2hz, where h just has a, a plane exponential distribution. So again, for these functions, it's actually very simple and straightforward to find the, uh, to find the GGC. Uh, I can look at powers. So uh, there's a very nice paper by uh, DeVroy, also a nice paper by uh, Bain, Pittman, and Yor. Mark, Yor spend a lot of time working on these types of problems where, again, uh, you can identify these, uh, these mixture distributions. And again, you've got mixtures of, of exponentials and mixtures of gammas uh, at, certain, uh, at certain zeros or things that will, will, that will be related to zeros. So hyperbolic functions. Uh, there's a very nice paper in Russian by Ostrovsky uh, where he looks at a whole general class of functions that depend on, on the uh, cosine of t. Now, why is that interesting? Well, again, the Riemann uh, Xi function and things like the Ramanujan Tau function uh, are very similar to mixtures of, of, uh, of Koshes. So, uh, again, it sort of has, it has links there. There's a very nice paper by De Bruijn in the 1950s and a bunch of papers since that look at functionals uh, of cosine. So there's a general class here of functions that uh, you can find GGCs and you can characterize the real zeros, so the Ostrovsky class as well. Okay, let me, let me just, uh, I've got three or four more examples to go. Uh, again, you know, I keep on referring you to the archive paper uh, but what's interesting about this framework is that uh, it can also do some of these generalized Riemann hypothesis problems. So the other nice thing of uh, this Thorin framework and looking at reciprocal functions to find the zeros is it also applies to, uh, to Dirichlet L series and uh, more general generalized Riemann hypothesis problems. So I uh, remember in the, in the other case we just had uh, chi of n equal to 1. But, you know, why does it apply? Well, again, you still have a uh, 
uh, an Euler product looking formula to uh, calculate these Dirichlet L series. And again, under regularity conditions, uh, you still have some Ramanujan master theorem that will let you analytically uh, extend those functions. And again, just like you, just like you look at uh, the Riemann Zeiss function, again you can normalize these functions uh, or regularize them with with gamma functions as well. And essentially, the same theory applies. So again, remember the trick is uh, that you go from Euler product first of all to Levy uh, form uh, and look something like this, and then essentially you find your you find your Levy measure. And really, the, the difference here is essentially this this term that comes in here. So, yeah, you can apply the uh, GGC Thorn framework to uh, uh, to general classes of L functions. Let me just give you uh, a couple of uh, a couple of uh, examples of that. So, for example, the Dedekind eta function. Uh, again, if you look in the if you look in the paper, you'll you'll find the full details. Uh, and there's a nice set of papers by Glasser that talks about Laplace transforms of these functions and what type of hyperbolic functions are they related to as well. So you can do a couple of interesting uh, hyperbolic functions based on the Dedekind uh, eta function, uh, which has a had a product form that looks something like this. Okay, another another classic, absolute classic function that's equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis is to look at the Ramanujan tau function. Uh, so again, if you uh, look at a function that looks something like this, the Ramanujan tau function, uh, the de Bruijn paper uh, is a very nice paper. Uh, again, there's an L-series representation for it. Uh, so we can look something like this. Uh, so weighted by tau sub n. Uh, and again, you can go from this to an Euler product looking formula. Uh, so again, you can then go work out your, you can regularize it with a gamma function. Uh, it turns out you want to uh, look at the symmetry condition about, around about six. And again, you can apply the same, uh, uh, the same theory. You know, first of all, uh, work out the Levy representation, then work out the Thorn representation, and then characterize the zeros. So in terms of density space, uh, it looks uh, something like this. Uh, and again, you'd, you'd have to try and force it into looking like a mixture of Bessel functions, uh, as you would do with Riemann polya. Or alternatively, rather than looking uh, in the density or kernel space, uh, you can essentially go back uh, look at the uh, Euler product expansion, work out the Levy measure, then work out the Thorn measure, then use Ramanujan's master theorem to, to extend it to the part of the plane you don't have, and then essentially check a Thorn's condition for uh, uh, for the Ramanujan tau function. So again, you know, Thorin uh, as opposed to looking at the Fourier transform and the density representation. Okay, so uh, let me conclude. Uh, so hopefully this, uh, this talk has given you an introduction uh, to a set of techniques for uh, looking at zeros or trying to find zeros of entire functions uh, and trying to show, show, find the real zeros, essentially to, to construct Adamard wire stress factorizations uh, via something called Van Danzig and Wald couples. I uh, remember Bonderson and Thorin provide the uh, uh, the details of GGC random variables, uh, which essentially explicitly find the Thorin measure. Uh, I directly applied it to the to the Clear Polya class, uh, where you had even function uh, with zeros plus or minus rho, uh, and then I explicitly calculated the Thorin measure. And we did a whole bunch of uh, we did a whole bunch of examples: uh, the zeta function, the xi function, l functions, Ramanujan's tau function, and then some more well-known functions where it's a lot easier to see what the GGC looks like. So gammas, reciprocal gammas, uh, Bessel functions, McDonald functions, trigonometric and hyperbolic.
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for listening.